Hi, I'm Joey Katzen, and I'm a lead mentor at Blue Startups. I'm originally from Virginia. I went to school in Atlanta, Georgia, Georgia Tech. I went to law school, uh, University of Virginia. Uh, and uh, about eight years ago, I found myself living in Hawaii. Um, as soon as I got here, I, I actually founded a startup back in the mainland. So I was flying back and forth, moved to the mainland, and had to lie, cheat, and steal to, to make it back to Hawaii. And, and now I ask, why, why would I live anywhere else? I'm a lead mentor of Blue Startups, which is a, a volunteer you know, thing to do. Uh, and there are a handful of us. Uh, there's a, a large mentorship network of people who kind of come in and help with specific seminars or specific uh, one-on-ones, uh, we call them office hours. Uh, a few of us have, are a little more involved. Um, so as a lead mentor, I get, uh, we have a matching every cohort of eight to 10 companies and, and we get specifically assigned to one of them. So one of the companies I'm assigned to is sort of a personal direct mentor and I spend a lot of time with them, spend a couple hours a week with them throughout the summer, uh, throughout the cohort. Um, but on top of that, I also do conduct office hours and I help people with things. And I, I, I actually personally, I teach a seminar on storytelling. Uh, I call it how to build FOMO, fear of missing out. Um, and I find it's something that is is core to so many things in, a, in any kind of business or any kind of organization is um, being able to have um, a very clear, crisply unexplainable um, vision to the outside world, it also works to the inside world. I, that everything else then flows from. I, to me, it all starts with what I call as a bar pitch. It's how do you explain what you do in one sentence to someone in a bar that you haven't seen in 10 years without any buzzwords, without uh, giving too much information about your business. And the only goal of it is to induce them to ask you one interesting question. And if they've asked you one interesting question, you've accomplished your goal. Because then it turns into a pull, not a push. You get to satisfy what interests them and you get to see, oh, is this a potential investor or a potential customer? Uh, is this a potential connector? Is this someone that could just be a good friend? Uh, or is this someone that doesn't have any particular interest in, maybe we should change the subject and not waste each other's time. Um, and so it's something I, I end up helping a lot of the startups with. I would find that most startups I meet really struggle with that um, but you know I have an exercise in the in the seminar and you know by the end of the program for sure after they have lots of time to work on it usually they have these these um, phenomenal fundraising decks that are usually they're very attractive and they tell a story and they have a really good linear narrative that leave people that are that are seeing them usually investors kind of on the, the edge of their seat at the, the end of each slide oh my god I had no idea the problem was so big well how do you solve it you know <laughs> oh you solve it that way well tell me more or you get to the end of the, the how it works and the product is like huh like but is the market really that big help me understand that oh look at that you got a slide on that and so it sort of takes them through that and I I love sort of helping companies with that expertise I remember when I was starting up, there was this, this startup scene uh, back in Atlanta in the late 90s, early 2000s, during that sort of first boom. I was uh, you know, involved in organizations that were sort of connecting students with business and things like that. And I would find these companies, these sort of enterprise software companies would come in. They'd have these visions or these uh, taglines or these explanations of their businesses and I had, I had, I mean, I, got, I don't know, I guess I was 20, 21 years old, but I, I, I really had no clue what they were doing. And I would go to their websites and I wouldn't really understand it. And what I took from that, honestly, at the time, because I was young and inexperienced was, this must be how the world works. This must be how business works. The, the goal of it must be to use so many buzzwords and be so high and mighty that people assume you know what you're talking about so that you can sort of convey this expertise and it's okay if we don't know what it is because we're paying you to solve some problem, even if I don't quite know what the problem is, but you seem smart. And what I found was I would ask around and I'd be like, so what is this company that's presenting, what do they do, right? Because everyone's, you know, initially, especially when you're new in this, is you're, you're scared to admit that you don't know something. Um, I've never been scared to, as, or I've been maybe a little scared, but I don't know, I've been less scared. I feel like that some of my friends have to admit that. I'm the first person to say, oh, I have no idea what you're talking about. I'm lost, I'm confused. Maybe I'm an idiot, I don't know. But sometimes it takes someone asking, 
I don't know, maybe I'm an idiot here, but I have no clue what you're talking about. And what I found over time is then I'd have friends of mine, we'd be talking about business ideas, and I, I, people would spend five or 10 minutes and they would talk my ear off about something. And by the end of it, I'd say, I'm really sorry. I'm like, you're my friend, but I don't actually understand what you're doing. And I found that there was a, you know, sort of a series of questions I could over time ask, you know, which sort of gets around stuff that seems like, ultimately seems like common sense, but sometimes you're so close to an idea, you don't recognize it. But it's, it's sort of at a generic level, what are you? Who do you do it for? Usually who are you, who's paying you? Uh, and then why do they want you? What's the benefit of it? Um, really closely tied to like what the value proposition is. Oftentimes people um, come to it uh, by, by hammering on features. Oh, well, we do this, and we do this, and we do this, and we do this. But at the end of the day, all I care about usually, if I'm a business, right, is are you making me more money top line, or are you saving me time, or are you saving me money? And it's, it's really the only three things it can be. Everything kind of boils down into it and, it, and it grows from there. If you're a consumer product, sometimes there are other particular value props. It's, does this make me feel cool? Does this help me find a date? Um, is it help me sort of in my social life? But on business software, if it's not one of those three things, if you can't boil it down, then you're missing something. So start from there and branch out. Um, but yeah, and I've just found that over time, I, 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 I love that sort of excitement that happens when I finally get an idea and the people I'm talking to who are so close to it figure out how to explain their idea and they understand their business even better than they did before. And all of us have this sort of like light bulb, ah, like, you know, aha moment. And it's it's uh it's invigorating and it's um it's exciting at that point because then everyone's sort of pumped to get involved. I mean, I have FOMO. I'm like, man, I'm so excited for you guys. I totally get this. Like, what can we do to help us set in motion? Do you want some you want some help finding some connectors here or or what? You know, when you're a CEO, you're sort of the 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 chief cheerleader, and you got to keep everyone excited, everyone on vision everything stops with you and when there's bad news you have to figure out how to break that Every, all these people's livelihoods are dependent on you and it, it doesn't matter what other role you have in a company a coo a chief product officer a cmo it's never the same responsibility as being that main guy that all the investors are going to turn to if something goes wrong all the employees are going to turn to if something goes wrong it's a lot of pressure and you find yourself in the situation where you you don't want to you never know how much information to share because you want to be super trans, completely transparent with your employees and your investors and your customers. But if you share every last little fear, everyone will lose faith in you. When you're a startup company, you're always a month away from everything shutting down and exploding, imploding, and the, the lights turning off. And so it's how do you sort of measure that along the way so that you know, you're a good guy to everyone, but everyone still has faith in the business. It's hard. That's the hardest part of being a CEO. It's a little less mainstream mainland America. It's almost a little bit European, a little bit like Australia, where people don't lead with their work. Like my experience in DC, to some extent in the Bay Area, even in Atlanta, is that people's, the work they do in their careers sort of encapsulate them, or they try to let it encapsulate them as part of their identity. It's the first question people ask you, oh, so what do you do? Um, and here it's, uh, it's a little discord. It's almost a little off-putting to be asked that question first. I, I accept it from people in the mainland, but here it's, oh man, where are you from? Or where do you live? Or what do you do? Or, or who do, you, uh, do we have friends in common? There are other ways to sort of connect. Um, there's not this idea that either I'm sizing you up or uh, I'm finding a way to, to connect specifically on work. I mean, eventually you can. If people are interested in what I'm doing, then I love talking. I love kind of finding out what they're doing for work, but only if people actually care. And so that tends to come later in a conversation. And so I just love that in, in people here. The, you know, the there is not a huge startup community here, but there is one. And you find that the the people that are in it sort of they we've all sort of self-selected by at least the expats of us. We've self-selected by moving here or by staying here, sort of there is a trade-off. There are not as many opportunities here, but we've self-selected to sort of have these opportunities that we do have along with having sort of that life balance and 
I find that really valuable. Obviously, the, you know, the weather and everything else is so the opportunities. Is, the hills are, you know, a few miles from here. I, where else can I be living at home, walking, you know, five minute walk from a, a Target and a Macy's and the beach, five minute walk from the beach, and in 20 minutes, I'm in the middle of a rainforest doing a waterfall hike. I, I don't know where anywhere else, you know, in the, in the US, it's anything like that. I love it. Thank you.